All right, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, as mentioned, my name is Frank Fernandez. Um, today I'll be walking you through what I call the great data scrape. So basically what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be looking at how the finance industry has evolved over the past few years, um, see how that has had an impact on the alternative data industry, and lastly, to see how kind of tech fits into all of that. So um, anyone here in the audience can recognize the background of my first slide. What scene? Can anyone name the scene from which movie? Anybody? Indiana Jones. Okay, which one? First one, The Lost Ark. Yes, first one, <laughs> Raiders of the Lost Ark. So the reason I kind of had the theme and the thought process behind this was that, you know, a lot of times when you refer to data mining, data scraping, it's referred to, you know, finding these little nuggets of gold while you're, while you're kind of scraping the web. So in that idea, in that notion, I kind of had a theme of Indiana Jones running through the whole presentation. I hope nobody minds, but that's kind of the idea behind it. Um, so yeah, so let's get into it. Just a little bit about me. Um, born and raised Honolulu, Hawaii. I've been in Japan now for over 10 years. I'm a permanent resident here. Um, I originally came as a professional football player, um, working in the uh, Japan X League, it's called. It's a company league here. Uh, since then, I transitioned into a career within finance, of which I've been involved with for the past uh, seven plus years. And just some fun facts, some special skills on the bottom line there is uh, I lift heavy things. Um, I love to eat, I can eat a lot, and, uh, and I honestly I'm pretty good at dancing. So um, just some things to add a little human touch to the presentation. But, uh, but yeah, so just a quick agenda for today. Uh, I'm going to go over the evolution of the financial industry, uh, the rise of the alternative data industry, um, a basic introduction to data scraping, uh, and then from there I'm going to introduce you into a Node.js library called Puppeteer, which um, helped me kind of learn and figure out how to data, data scrape uh, on my own, which is very, very uh, beneficial. And then I'll just wrap it up in a nice uh, conclusion there. Um, so yeah, so as mentioned, um, I did, I started my first job at uh, Credit Lyonnais, also known as CLSA, as a sales trader, uh, trading Japanese equities. Uh, the model there was a very traditional brokerage where they focused on research. Um, and that means like analyst meetings, company meetings, and presenting the information that they were able to gain to the end investor. Um, this is an old model that's gonna have to change and we'll go into a bit of the reasons why that is. So um, since then, I, I joined the company called Evolution Japan Asset Management, which was a hedge fund, or which is a hedge fund here in Japan. And one, one thing I learned while working with them and one thing that the way they approached the market was they had this notion of information arbitrage, or what we call edge. So the idea being that we're only gonna put on trades that we believe we have information that the rest of the market doesn't have. So originally, traditionally, as mentioned, it came through the brokerage model, where maybe an analyst from a bank would be meeting with a company, and there's some sort of nugget of information they would get from the company, which they would relay to the investor, in this case, Evolution, and therefore have a tradable idea to make money off. Um, but as you're going to see, this is how this has kind of changed, um, and there's a lot of regulations around that. So now I think the industry itself is going to have to change how they approach um, providing value to their end client. Uh, and lastly, just to note, uh, while I was at the hedge fund, I did work on some quantitative uh, strategies there, where there were some software developers involved with uh, with creating strategies, scraping for data, and monitoring cer certain um, strategies. Uh, one in particular that I worked on was where we used to track various uh, analysts across the street at different banks, and would see based on their recommendations, was it an action, actionable trade? Would we be able to make money off of their recommendations? Uh, that strategy did okay, but, but in, the, in the grand scheme of things, that quantitative team does very well with kind of scraping and monitoring data and being able to monetize that in the form of a trade. So, um, so yeah, so one of the things that, that has been affecting, obviously, the financial industry is a regulation called MIFID II. Uh, this is something that came about uh, post the Lehman crisis, coming out of Europe, where basically, uh, as a result, they're gonna have, they're siphoning off the commission spend. Originally, you, you would spend as a client commission dollars for research and execution of the trade um, in one combined bundle. But now that they're separating the two, we're noticing that commission dollars as it relates to research is coming down drastically. So um, as you can see here, it's also affecting the US as uh, commission pools have come down around 42% since then. Um, so yeah, so as a result, the value that the banks are gonna have to add is gonna have to change. So, um, 
so yeah, so, so this is just kind of further belaboring the point. It's even touching down here in Japan where a uh, very well-known bank, uh, Credit Suisse, had an issue as well maybe a few years back with one of their analysts going to meet a company. And as a result of meeting the company, whatever information they relayed back to the end client, uh, they had issues for it. They got dinged, dinged for it. Not, very, not, not a big penalty at only 60 million uh, yen. But still, nonetheless, the, the value that they're able to extract from the traditional brokerage model as far as meeting with companies um, and trying to get data that way to bring it to the end client, again, is, is being hampered by regulation. So. Um, yeah, so, so this, is, this gives rise to the alternative data industry. And what does that mean? It means anything that is not a traditional source of information for uh, investors. So basically that means nothing that uh, might come from a, a press clipping or a financial statement. Um, so these are all other ways and, and data scraping is included in this, um, this term, alternative data. Um, but yeah, some interesting tidbits and facts are surrounding that. Uh, over 2.5 quintillion bytes of data are created every single day and it's only going to grow from there. By 2020, it is estimated that 1.7 megabytes of data will be created every second for every person on Earth. And what does that mean? You're talking about maybe downloading 20 songs per minute per person across the globe. So a lot of data is coming out um, and something to be very, very mindful of. And yeah, just kind of to, to further kind of echo that, the global market for big data um, as it relates right now is estimated to be around $130 billion US. Uh, by 2020, it's expected to grow to 200 billion. So, so something that can't be ignored, clearly. One second. Did it go? Okay. Cool. So yeah, so alternative data, uh, we're just going to go through some of the different data types that that involves. Um, one of the se segments is called individuals, where basically you're looking at social media, whether that's Twitter, um, Facebook, what have you, to determine kind of sentiment on a given stock based on who's tweeting positively or negatively about it, um, web traffic, how often a website's being visited, app usage, how often apps being used, very, very uh, clear there. But some of the business processes as well is a different data type where you're looking at credit card data, web data, public data, uh, emails. Um, and then it also goes even further into sensors like geolocation, satellite, and weather, so basically taking shots or video sort of data, is you need to take into consideration the robots.txt file. Uh, this is, you know, it's kind of on your honor, but there are some legal ramifications. You could get your IP address blocked if you don't respect what's written here on the robots.txt file. So as, Mark, as you can see Mark there to, on the very top with the one, is that uh, a few bots, a few user agents are blocked from everything. Uh, the following line there, you can see in line number two, is that Twitter is allowed to scrape and crawl as much as it wants. Uh, and then lastly, everybody else, uh, and you can see here all the various websites or the uh, web pages that they do not allow any scraping or crawling. Luckily, the data I wanted was not on that list, so uh, it's all good, good to go. Um, so yeah, so the data selection process is pretty easy. Uh, just navigate it to the website there. Um, as you can see there marked in the one, this is basically a table of uh, all the players from 2018 and all the statistics that they, they were able to, uh, that they put up, that they posted. Uh, and basically Todd Gurley just being one guy that I wanted. I wanted to get the name, uh, the team name, position, and it goes on, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, but the thing is, it's pretty simple. All you have to do is do a simple right click, um, inspect the elements within your uh, Google Chrome browser, and then from there, you're going to go ahead and try to navigate to the element um, within the uh, element section here in, in uh, Chrome. And then from there, you're just going to right click, copy, and copy the selector, um, which you're going to be using within the building of your data scraper. So um, I thought this process was, was pretty easy. Um, but yeah, I'll show, I'll show you more. Yeah, so just a quick note on a selector. It's, it's basically an address, something that's pointing to the specific element, HTML element, that you would like to access. Um, as you can see here, I've, uh, this is actually from my, uh, my data script and what I was able to kind of program. But uh, this here, undermarked in red, is actually the address or the selector that I use. 
to get the player's age, uh, which you can kind of see is, is deeply nested under so, uh, an ID fantasy within a body, within a row. Um, so yeah, so just a quick note on that if you're unfamiliar. Yeah, so um, yeah, this is the basic code. Um, we are dealing with promises here within JavaScript. So we did use a kind of a try catch, um, a sync away type of uh, format in trying to get the data here. But pretty simple, um, you, you create a new browser instance, you open up a new page within that browser, you navigate to the website, um, and basically go ahead and grab, grab the data. Uh, yeah, and this is kind of all the data that as I kind of uh, kind of scrape through that table is kind of everything I wanted to see. Um, one thing I will note is that uh, the data structure was something that you had to take into consideration. Was that the table of data, as easy and as straightforward as it was, a couple of the issues that I came into was that uh, every so often, maybe every 30th row or so, there was another row of headers that came about. And every time I reached this row, the scraper would break, I wouldn't get any data. Um, so basically one way to avoid that was just, as I, I did, I created a while loop here, looping through each row within the DOM, and basically once I hit that row number, uh, I would just uh, increment by two instead of one, just to avoid it. Pretty simple, but, uh, but something to take into consideration is obviously the data that you're able to get, the web page structure changes from web page to web page. Um, so yeah, so just want to make a quick note on that. Uh, and then, yeah, this is, uh, this is basically it. You're going to write the file here to a path given. Um, note that you do have to close the browser once you're done. And there's our little uh, catch statement here. As we're doing the so. Uh, yeah, so this is what we were able to get. Nice and clean, a JSON file, which is very, uh, for those who use JavaScript, very easy to use and put into a database. Um, yeah, so very, very easy. As you can see, I, got, I was able to get the data from Todd Gurley in that year and position rank, et cetera. So, so very, very easy to kind of get the data and therefore manipulate it, put it into a database uh, later on. Uh, yeah, so obviously, I mean, in this whole process, it was great. It was pretty straightforward um, outside of having to deal with the data structure on that particular web page. Um, it was, you know, a pretty easy process. But the one thing that uh, moving forward, that took, it, to be honest, it took a bit of time um, running this whole process. So I can imagine the more pages that you're going to want to scrape, the more websites you're going to crawl, you're going to have to kind of speed things up, speed the process up. So um, in researching a bit, uh, some of the things to consider to potentially speed things up would be um, uh, storing cookies and caching in a custom path. Uh, because every time a browser is open, this, uh, the browser is having to store all the images, CSS, et cetera, into a temp directory. Um, and every time you do that, it's going to have to get reloaded. Um, but I will know that the assets are still used when rendering, so there is a way to kind of take it a step further. And this is where Puppeteer actually has uh, some pretty neat and nifty ways um, with their custom hooks and interceptor, which I'll talk about within the next slide. And then I'll also touch briefly on this concept of parallelization. Um, so yeah, so Interceptor, um, very, very cool here as, as you're kind of going through a data script. If the resource type is not a document, you can skip, choose to skip it completely. And you can kind of see that here indicated with the red arrow. Uh, if you come across an image or some other sort of resource data type, then you can avoid it completely. And this is one way where you can kind of speed up the whole process or optimize your crawl um, and or scrape. So, uh, very, very nifty there, for sure. But yeah, and then just uh, just briefly talk about the, the concept of parallelization. Uh, you're talking about basically just opening up more Chrome browsers, opening up more pages within that browser. Um, but And the only thing to really consider with this point is that uh, everything will depend on, on your machine, the machine that you're using. So um, how many pages can you have up on each browser? How many browsers can you have up at one given time? before your computer crashes. So just something that you personally can only answer, um, but something to consider as you try to use or utilize this concept of parallelization. Yeah, so as moving forward, um, as, you, as the web, the more you're gonna crawl, the more you're gonna scrape, some things to consider. Um, if you're gonna build your own um, data scraper, web crawler, um, 
first thing is distributed denial of services. So this is something where, depending on how often, how consecutively you're pinging the server for requests, um, you could get a red flag and ultimately have your IP address flagged on that. Um, so I guess current, uh, the thought behind that now is to have a, have a wait of maybe two seconds between consecutive requests to the server. Uh, so something to keep into consideration when you are building your, uh, your web crawler. Um, yeah, we touched on it uh, briefly already. It's just basically the non-uniform web structures, the advent of AJAX elements and dealing with that in your data scrape can add a level of complexity, uh, which must be considered as well. Um, and then, yeah, in terms of, of not having your IP address being blocked, this is obviously something to consider, is how you're crawling, the pattern you're crawling, to consider maybe changing the way in which that you're crawling um, the various web pages. Maybe something to consider as well as maybe rotating IP addresses. Uh, maybe changing the outgoing IP with the use of a VPN um, and or proxy services. And then just to be aware about what's called honeypot traps. So this is something a normal user like you and me, if we were browsing the web, we would not see these elements. But uh, sometimes if, if you're not paying attention as a web crawler or scraper, you would interact with these elements, which are, you know, as you can see here, CC display none, which are visible to the user. Um, and obviously, if we're crawling that, it's a clear indication that, that we are a bot. So um, something to keep in mind as, uh, as you try to build up and kind of extend this whole concept of scraping uh, and crawling going forward. Uh, so yeah, so basically in conclusion, as you can see, the finance industry itself is going through a massive wave of evolution as it, as it regards to how they can provide edge to their end client. Um, the traditional model of research, going on analyst meetings, analyst visits, and relaying that to your end client um, is no longer, well, it's not like how it used to be, let's say that. So uh, regulations are affecting this. Uh, but with that being the case, we are seeing the rise of alternative data. And as I just showed you, it's pretty easy to create your own scraper on a very basic level. Um, so yeah, so I just want to encourage you to maybe take a look at Puppeteer, maybe give scraping a shot. Uh, and yeah, and just see how it goes. So thank you for your time. I'm hoping to be available for questions after. Hi, my name is Jill. The name of my talk is Why Me to Think and List. So who am I and why should you care? I am not a professional who works with Lisp in any capacity. I am, in fact, a student at a boot camp and my primary language is JavaScript. But um, as a person who's really new to programming in general, I just started in January, and I'm new to programming languages, I feel like the best time to teach something is right after you've learned it. And I'm a person who's just got over the learning curve of some learning something that's totally new to me it is totally difficult. And I'm in a position to perceive the value of that. And so I'm kind of, you know, I feel like I'm the ideal person to bring to you today a basic overview of list and try to explain it to everyone. So I actually want to start by talking about human languages. And I'm sure a lot of the people here are multilingual because this is an English language talk that I'm giving in Japan. And you might know that when you learn a new language, the best way to become fluent in that language is by learning to think in it. So you want to be able to formulate thoughts in the target language that you're trying to learn and just generate those rather than translating in your head from your native language. So there's this idea in um, linguistics, this idea of linguistic relativism. And I think that it's also applicable to programming languages. And that idea is that the grammar and structure of your language actually influences the way that you think. That you're going to think differently in different languages depending on what language you know. So we can ask if the grammar of our language influences the way that we perceive the world. And in terms of programming languages, we can ask if the structure and syntax of our language and the options available within it influence the way that we solve problems. So, there's a language called Gugu Yimuthir, which is an Aboriginal Australian language. It's where we get the word kangaroo from. And they have geocentric directions instead of egocentric directions, which means that instead of saying left, right, forwards, and backwards, they always refer to things by being north, south, east, and west. 
So that means that they have to be consciously aware of how they are positioned in the world at all times in terms of you know, where is north, where is south, where is east and west. And as a native English speaker, I never think about that. I have no idea. Right now I couldn't tell you like that. But if I spoke this language, I would have to know that all the time. And so it's kind of an example of how the structure of different languages can influence how um, we think. So when people learn English, a lot of times if you learn Latin and Greek roots of words, you might have a better understanding of the English language. It helps you with harder, longer words because um, there's so many roots from those languages in English. And it helps us kind of uh, get better at the English language. And some people might say that learning Lisp is like that for other languages because of the <coughs> fundamentals that Lisp can represent. However, I also think that learning Lisp is a little bit like having to learn Google Yemeth there because you're being forced to really think outside of the box and sometimes even about the box. And while learning Google Yemeth there maybe wouldn't help people with English, I think learning Lisp and just learning to think so differently is going to help you no matter what programming language you choose to write in. By learning only one programming language or staying within one particular paradigm, you might be constrained in your thinking and problem solving. And so as someone who has come really recently to programming, I have struggled with the idea that without knowing what is possible, I don't know what questions to ask, let alone what the answers to those questions are. And other people might have the same problem, but because they've gotten comfortable with what they do know, they don't necessarily know that they have that problem. When you learn a programming language and you kind of stick with it and become really entrenched in thinking in that language, you start to forget that there might be other ways of thinking about the problem other than the way that your language um, encourages you to think. So, what is Lisp and why should you care? Um, Lisp is a functional language. It's sort of known for being kind of wacky. And um, <laughs> in my limited perspective, it's made me much uh, more comfortable solving certain types of problems. So, you know, if you become comfortable with Lisp, you'll become comfortable solving certain types of problems that you wouldn't necessarily um, be able to solve as comfortably in the languages, the other languages that you know. Lisp really lends itself to solving certain issues and certain problems. And when you can learn to think that way, you can then apply that to problems kind of across the board. So um, Lisp started in the 1950s. It kind of rose to prominence over the 60s and 70s. It was the language of choice for artificial programming, uh, artificial intelligence programming in the 1980s. And um, some of the association with that might have been why it maybe declined, but um, I don't know that it necessarily has declined. We could ask, is this a hipster thing? And <laughs> I mean, I love old things. I collect vintage clothing, I collect antiques, books, records, and I maybe came to this language because of that. I'm just like attracted to old stuff that like people still love. But like people do still write in lists. And you know we don't have to say that it necessarily even should be niche. It has a lot of value. However, I do have to say, there's a lot of academic depth to Lisp. We are only going to scratch the surface on a few topics. This is not a talk about the application of Lisp in terms of developing an end product. It's not. I'm not going to talk about that. Sorry. So this, this book, the wizard book, the Structure and Interpretation of Computer Programs. This textbook introduced people to programming using the language scheme, which is a dialect of Lisp. And it was used to touch, teach MIT's introductory programming course for two decades. And so some of that association is why maybe Lisp has developed a little bit of the mystique that it has for some people, because it was presented in this, as this very like kind of esoteric, arcane, like art. And there is something kind of magical about Lisp, I think. 
and it makes sense. And part of the reason why like this is cool is because I am a beginner to programming, and I can come into Lisp and like I can pick it up pretty quickly. It's really hard to master, but it's easy enough to pick up the syntax of Lisp. And so that's why I can just come here and present it to you in this talk today. And Lisp is also a good introductory language because it illustrates some of the fundamentals of computer programming. And if you learn to think in this language, you're going to look at problems a different way. So, in Lisp, basically everything is done recursively. The syntax is pretty simple. There's loads of parentheses. It's pretty well known for that. <laughs> and writing this does look like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 yeah, so, there's a lot of dialects of Lisp uh, that can also be confusing if you're just coming to it. Like, what do I use? Uh, one dialect of Lisp is Scheme. And in particular for this talk, I'm going to be using a dialect of Scheme called Racket. Um, Racket does have some differences, and some of the uh, syntax things in this presentation might be a little bit specific to Racket, but uh, just be aware of that. And so this is the IDE for Racket, called Dr. Racket, and uh, we'll have to see if this is going to be very visible, but I've put some stuff into here and some of the slides and like run it, because I am not live coding for you. <laughs> but yeah, that would go terribly. <coughs> okay, so let's learn it. Yeah, we're all going to benefit. Okay, so basic syntax. I'm going to talk about this from a JavaScript perspective because that's my main language and that's what I know, and so we're going to compare it. Um, in JavaScript and in other normal, sane programming <laughs> languages, <laughs> one plus one is going to look like that, right? It's going to spit out two. In Lisp, one plus one is going to look like that. So we have the parentheses, and we have this plus sign as a, a prefix notation. Still going to spit out two. And if you are coming at this from a JavaScript perspective, I know some of my uh, classmates are here, uh, it's going to conceptually be a bit more like this. It's like a function call as opposed to an operator. So I did put it into Dr. Racket, and we cannot see it very well, but it works. I promise you, it works. <laughs> um, something that's really interesting about Lisp is that um, there's kind of two basic things in it. Everything is either an atom or a list. And this is, even in the original paper that kind of laid out like what Lisp was going to be, it didn't have numbers. Instead, it just um, represented numbers as lists because the integer n can be represented as a list of n elements. But it made doing math really weird and inefficient, but yeah, there is numbers in this stuff. Numbers, good, okay. <clears throat> Another thing about sort of the parentheses and the ways these things look is that if you're used to math, you're looking at the parentheses as indicating things like the order of operations. And parentheses in lists are not really like that. However, in an example like this, we can kind of map where the parentheses and <coughs> the operators are going to move to. And I've color coded it. Oh, the colors don't show up very well either. That's okay. You can see that the <laughs> we've just sort of moved uh, the operator to the front. We've moved the plus. And this is going to be evaluated differently than it would be in math. So don't be afraid of the parentheses. It's like everyone's favorite joke to make about this. But there's loads of parentheses, but don't let that put you off from Lisp, because once you get into writing it, you are not quite as afraid of them. And it's really more like this, like, you just learn to think about the parentheses as grouping the different S expressions and things that you have <coughs> in your writing. Sorry, I'm sick, so I'm like losing my voice. So I do also want to talk about how Lisp can represent data structures. Like I said, everything in Lisp is technically an atom or it's a list. And 
I think it's a really good language for representing and learning to internalize certain types of data structures. So here, we can break this down into a tree. So the outer parentheses, outer S expression is a list, and coming off of it, the plus with the three, then we have another list, eight, two. And we can break this list down even further. And if you get into writing this, you can learn to start thinking about these things and the way they're being evaluated as a tree. And if you're coming at programming from a new perspective, then learning about these data structures is really important. So, lists and lists. Uh, a basic list is going to look like this, but what it actually is, is more like this. So everything in list is a linked list. And that's what those consoles are. So again, put it into dark market. Okay? That's what it looks like. Consoles. Consoles are the basic structure of a linked list. And so what's happening here is that you have two cells, and in the first cell is going to be a value, and in the second cell is going to be a pointer to another value. And so here we have one in the first cell, and in the second cell we have a pointer to two. And this is what it's going to look like when they're all chained together. So we have one, we have empty, well not empty, but pointing to second, pointing to three, pointing to four, until we get to the end, and then that's an empty. So the second cell can have either a pointer to another value, or it can have an empty. And that is the basis of all the lists in lists. Again, here's just another example of how that is going to look. Yep. Okay. So, when we talk about how to handle these lists, um, there's two things I want to talk about. The first one is using first, which is a racket term. In a lot of other dialects of lists, it's something called car. And that is taking the first thing off of the list. There's also rest or cutter, and that's how we are taking the rest of the list. And so we can use these two things to actually do a lot of types of lists and manipulate them in a lot of different ways. And first and rest are the words for this in racket. In other dialects, it's car and cutter. So, the way that this is going to look is like that. We have the outer parentheses first, and then we put our list in there. Gives us the first thing in the list. Then, rest, and it gives us the rest of that list. And again, let's see how it looks. Yay, it works. Okay. So, this is some more basic syntax I'm going to go over. Defining functions. So the way that we're going to define functions is by using the word um, define. And then I have uh, listed out some of the parts of how this works. So here, define is a function that's going to take in two arguments. So you can see the two things there are the two arguments that define is taking in. Also, there, um, there's no explicit assignment to uh, the function return value made in list. A function is just an expression, and the value is the return value of the subprogram. So here we're defining it. The second argument is the template for what it's going to look like. And then the, the next argument is the function call that it's equivalent to. So that's what it's going to do. And when we write it out, it's going to work. Yes, OK. So I put it into doc bracket, and it does indeed work. We can double 4, we can double 2,000, we can double 484. So, booleans. This is basically like JavaScript, except again with the prefix notation. So here we're just comparing is 1 equal to 1? It is. Here we're comparing is 1 equal to 2? No, it is not. And in when we're, I'm going to get to this slightly later, but there is something called cond, which we can use kind of like an if statement, basically. So we have to talk about recursion if we're going to talk about this. And just sort of basically what is recursion. And so 
Recursion is just calling a function from within inside itself. And it is kind of the act of, of solving a problem in terms of itself. Recursion is always going to encourage you to be able to break down the problem into these smaller chunks and then deal with the problem in these just tiny incremental chunks. And it's actually a really good way of solving problems. So in JavaScript, to do basic is even, we have this. We check here. If the number is equal to zero, we return true. If the number is equal to one, we return false. Then as long as the number is greater than zero, we return is even with the number minus two. And the parts of this, the first half here is the base case. This is like just the, what we are trying to get down to at the very bottom of everything. If it's one of these two things, we can make some kind of decision, or the computer can make some kind of decision about the number that we put in. And then here is some incremental work that we're doing to get closer to the base case, and then we're calling the function again. So the incremental work here is just subtracting two from whatever our number is until we get down to either zero or one. Yeah, the function, the call to it is coming from inside the function. That's a screenshot from a movie from 1979. You know what else is popular in 1979? Lisp, so. <laughs> <laughs> define our is even function there. It's going to take in a number as an argument. We have that comma there. Our conditions are that if the number is equal to zero, it's true. If the number is equal to one, it's going to be false. And if it's not, we're going to call it again with two subtracted from our number. And so here, put it into Dr. Rackage and it runs. Yay. So one of the things that I really wanted to get into was how to reverse a linked list. And this is something that I think is really interesting because this is the kind of question that, you know, we get asked, especially as, as students, we have to do kind of solving algorithms, doing these problems. And it's really interesting for me to try to approach some of these more recursive type problems from a list perspective when writing them in JavaScript. So in JavaScript, we might write a solution of how to reverse a linked list kind of like this, where we're just checking to see, you know, we're trying to get down to the last head of the list. Oh boy, there's a lot of, I hope I didn't click too much. There's a little bit of a delay here in my clicking. But yeah, so here we're just, you know, we're feeding the next thing in the list into our reverse function checking to see or setting these things as different, you know, let's do it in Lisp. <laughs> so in Lisp, we can do it like this. Here we are, I'm going to use two different functions, one's a helper, and we're defining first reverse list. It's going to take in a list, and it's going to then call a reverse list implementation, which is going to have two things, a list and empty. And so what we want to do is we want to have these two concurrent lists where we're just taking the first element off of that list and then putting it onto the other list and then taking the next element, putting it onto the other list again and having them chain up like that. And so that's what we're doing. We're starting with list A and list B is going to be empty. And we're saying that at the point when list A becomes empty, then we just return list B, which should now be full of everything going backwards. So all we do is say, if it's not empty, and let's put the rest of list A back into our reverse list implementation, and then we're going to cons the first element of list A onto list B, and just keep going with that until the list is reversed. We can put it into Dr. Racket, and it works. I'm not lying, list works. <laughs> so we can also rewrite this in JavaScript in a more lispy way where here we have the same thing. The reverse list function takes in my list and returns the reverse list implementation with my list and null. And then here, reverse list implementation, my list A, let my list B, it does the exact same thing, but in more of a list way. And so we're tackling the problem in a different way because we're thinking with a different language. I also took one of those poems that like, if you reverse all the words, it's a different poem. This one's by Alan Moore. 
And so I broke it up, and I made it every word into a string, and I put it into my reverse list in Lisp. And uh, at first it looked like this thing, because I didn't fix the settings, so we just had a billion consoles all the way down with the words in it, but then it worked. Okay, so you might be asking what is the point of this again, if we didn't forget. So there's this language, which I'm not sure I should say the name of. But, <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, it starts with brain and ends with another word. Okay. But this presumably offers a different perspective from which to analyze problems, right? But that's not, I don't know, I mean, yeah, you can learn it, and maybe it'll offer you a different perspective to analyze problems, but that's not necessarily what I'm saying in saying that you should learn Lisp. It's that people often come up with answers to problems that are okay, but they're not the best solution. And the reason why they didn't come up with those solutions is just because they simply aren't aware of them. So I want to bring up this quote from a book um, about a professional Scrabble player. And it's about comparing uh, everyday Scrabble players to professional ones. And the quote is this. In a way, the living room player is lucky. He has no idea how miserable he feels with every turn, how many possible words or optimal plays slip by unnoticed. The idea of Scrabble greatness doesn't exist for him. And I think in programming, this same idea can exist. But a lot of times, you might be really complacent in the language that you've chosen and not really interested in learning other languages. And because of that, you just think of how to solve the problem in terms of the language that you already know without necessarily um, being able to come up with the more ideal solution. So you have to be able to think in a language in order to write programs in it, and you have to know that those options are available. And so that's sort of the, the basis of why I'm trying to encourage this. Because if, for example, you worked in a language that didn't have recursion, you would never even think to do it. It wouldn't be a tool that's available for you, and then you would be missing out on all the things that you could do with it. So, you know, you might be saying, okay, well, I guess I should learn this, but it seems really, really weird and hard, and I'm not sure that I want to learn that. And my idea really is just that the key here is that when you do learn a new language, just pick one that is unfamiliar to you, or pick one that has different features than what you're used to, and kind of force yourself through that learning curve. Because I just learned to, I just learned JavaScript, this was the second language that I learned. Both of them are really different and really difficult to sort of, you know, even just start picking up because it seems like a gigantic learning curve that's going to be really hard to get over. But there's so much value in forcing yourself to wrap your head around new concepts, especially as you kind of go forward and you become really settled in the concepts that you are familiar with and that you know you aren't necessarily challenging yourself or forcing yourself to learn or forcing yourself to think differently. And I think that learning to think differently is something that's really important, especially as we move forward and try to come up with new and better solutions to things. You should always be growing, changing, learning, whether that's by picking up Lisp or picking up a different language. Like, just try stuff. So, thank you. And thank you so much for coming. Uh, so today I'm going to talk to you about developing and publishing a React Native app. Uh, but before we get into it, I want to do a quick self-introduction. So my name is Mark. Uh, I'm originally from Denmark. I came here to Tokyo in early January of this year. Oh, it doesn't look like that. Beautiful. I'm a former musician and IT consultant. Uh, I was working um, as an IT consultant for two years before coming here. Uh, and I'm a self-taught developer, and that's why I joined the uh, Code Crystalist code uh, to fill the gaps in my knowledge and to gain the skills that I need in order uh, to become a software engineer. So, let's get into it. Uh, today I hope you walk away from this presentation with three takeaways. Number one being how easy it is for you to get started developing a React Native app, uh, how to debug in React Native, and the publishing process on Google Play. So you might ask, 
why choose React Native? So there are a lot of things to be excited about with React Native. Uh, one thing being that uh, if you know React beforehand, it's super easy to, to get into. Uh, you can almost just uh, jump into it, almost. Uh, and you can write apps using only JavaScript, which is super, super cool, so you don't need to do any native code, uh, but you can do it all in JavaScript, which is super cool. And you can develop uh, both for iOS and Android uh, with the same code base, uh, and that can additionally save you some, uh, and that can reduce the development time because uh, you can maintain the single, uh, single code base and you don't have to maintain two separate ones at the same time. Um, Reckit is used by uh, companies such as Facebook, which comes as no surprise because they develop it, they kind of have to. Uh, it's used by Skype, it's used by Bloomberg, by uh, Instagram, Netflix, and Uber. Uh, so there's a lot of great functionality in React Native, uh, and that has definitely been recognized by some big companies, and there are more than I have just here. Uh, so there are a lot of great support for, for out, in, out in the market. Uh, but like all good technologies, there's some caveats of using it. So one thing being, components can render differently. Uh, and that's of course by design, so a component it will visually uh, look different on iOS than it will on Android. Uh, but the thing I'm talking about here is, for example, the width of the component. Uh, so if you do a drop-down list, uh, maybe it will span half the width of the screen on iOS, and maybe full width on Android. Um, you may experience that sometimes, but it can be super frustrating when you're doing development. Uh, some modules may not exist, or may be underdeveloped, uh, so if you find yourself needing a component uh, that's not supported by a React Native, uh, then you need to import a package for it, or you need to develop it yourself. Uh, which brings you to the next point. So while I said that it, it, it is possible for you to develop an app using only React Native and, and JavaScript, that one may be true, uh, but only to some extent. Uh, because if you do more uh, complex projects or bigger projects, uh, where you need to do some kind of, uh, of custom behavior, uh, then you need to bring in some people who can do native coding. Uh, and that will also, of course, uh, affect your, um, your single code base uh, because uh, then you will start branching off into the iOS version and the Android version. And of course, it is easier for us to get into if you are a JavaScript developer uh, because it is using JavaScript. So if you're coming from a, uh, from a back-end background, uh, maybe it's not as intuitive for us to get into. And there are, uh, of course, some competitors uh, out there in the market that are trying to do the same thing. Uh, so we have uh, Severin, it does the same thing as cross-development, uh, but using C-sharp instead of JavaScript. So that might be an, e an easier option for you if, if you come from back in uh, position. Then we have NativeScript, it does the same thing as React Native again, uh, but using Angular, Vue, or TypeScript. We have Cordova, which enables you to, which enables you to write apps uh, using HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. And then we have the new player in the game. We have Google's Flutter, which uses Google's own language, uh, Dart, uh, Flutter is getting a lot of traction at the moment uh, and, and it's growing a lot, so it's going to be interesting to see where, where that ends up. So for me personally, as a developer who likes uh, developing in React, it was, uh, it was natural for me to go with React Native for my first app. Uh, but that's not to say that it's the only solution out there. Maybe some of these uh, suits your needs better. Uh, but I highly recommend React Native because it's, it's super easy to get into and it's really fun to work with. So you might ask now, how do I get started with it? So as, as, as we learned at the Code Prisoners, always start out by reading the documentation. Um, and the React Native documentation is super easy to read, and they provide these, um, uh, these bite-sized code snippets that you can play around with uh, on the website uh, to, to, uh, to get you more comfortable with the components that are being described. And that's really helpful. Uh, and after you read the documentation, you have uh, two ways of, of going about this. You can use the Expo CLI, uh, which is more friendly for developers with a web background because it kind of protects you uh, from all the scary native code. Um, and, and if any of you are familiar with, with Webpack, it's kind of the same principle. So it will scaffold the project for you, uh, but it will, it will hide a lot of code from you initially. But you can, at, at any time, eject it if you have the need to. And you can start a project without installing a configure Xcode and Android Studio. Uh, which is super nice uh, if you just want to get started immediate, immediately and don't want to, to spend time configuring these tools because it, it can take some time. And you can get development going uh, just like that because it scaffolds the project for you and you just run start and then, it, and then it works. The other option is React Native CLI, which caters more to people uh, who know native development because it exposes you to the native code. And that does require the need of the Xcode and Android Studio 
Uh, but I guess if you already are doing native development, then you will probably have one of these tools installed uh, already. And again, you can get running in a couple of minutes because it will scaffold the project for you. Uh, so we're soon going to dive into a demo, uh, but before we do that, uh, I want to provide you with some context for the, some of the technologies I want to, uh, I want to talk about, and, uh, and just show a quick code example of how it is to work in React Native. So we are, here I've made a very simple to-do app. Um, for those of you who know React beforehand, this will seem quite familiar. So we have our component here, our class component, that has the constructor with props inside, uh, with, uh, with state inside, and our render uh, method. But the key difference here is that we're not working with HTML, we're working with native components. So we have the view here, uh, and that's, that's the native equivalent of a div, uh, as we know from, uh, from web development. And underneath that we have a text component, uh, so in React Native we're not working with, uh, with paragraph tags or like h1s uh, or similar uh, text tags. Uh, we only have this one tag that we just have to style accordingly to the, to the, to the thing we need for. And then we have, we have the custom component that we made ourselves, which I've made down here the, the to do this component, and that will in our and that will return in, that will return another native component called a flat list, and that is kind of the native equivalent of uh, of an unordered list. Yeah, um, and the next thing I want to uh, talk about is what Redux is. Um, I just want to give a very high level explanation for it uh, in case you don't, uh, you, in case you're not familiar with it. So when you're working with React and React Native, uh, you have the ability to pass down data from one component to another, and again, uh, from there into another component, and you can keep this whole chain going. And, and that is fine if you're working on a smaller app, uh, but as soon as your app grows in size, it can become quite complex and hard to, to keep track of. Uh, so that's depicted here, um, here on the left. So we have this component here that will initiate a change, and then you can see it causes this whole chain reaction with data path being passed around all the uh, through our um, so, uh, so Redux, as I mentioned, is a state management library. So it, keeps, so it helps you centralize your state in one place called the store, which is uh, being depicted here. Uh, so when you're working with Redux, you have this component here, for example, that will, um, uh, that, will, uh, that will submit a change to the store. And when it does that, uh, all components will subscribe to the store with that data that's been changed. It will automatically receive it. Um, and that's one really cool thing about Redux is that uh, each, pro each component can individually subscribe to the store without, um, so you sort of don't have this whole hierarchy of passing out data. Yeah, so that's a very high level information of what it does. So let's dive into a demo. Uh, so my, uh, my app is called Whatcast. It is a podcast app um, with a small twist, and it is that you can get a random podcast if you want to. Uh, I myself really like listening to podcasts, and sometimes want to explore a bit, uh, but don't know quite where to start. So I thought it could be a fun, uh, Fun feature to implement. So I'm sorry to uh, step over here, but I need to use my computer. So I already have my Android emulator going here, where I have what class installed. So let's try and open it. And it will immediately uh, open on the random page where it will render the artwork of the podcast and a description, and then of course the episode that you can play. Uh, if, you press, if, if you don't particularly like uh, the podcast that you get, you can press randomize, and you can get a new one until you find one that, uh, that suits your needs. And then at the bottom here, we have this uh, navigation component, uh, random and discover. So if I press here, I go to some more uh, more classic podcast functionality. Uh, so I get uh, some predefined categories uh, and some pre uh, pre-level podcasts for you. And of course, it's also possible for you to search for podcasts if you want to. Uh, so I want to listen to something about games, let's say. So I open this one. And then again, I get the artwork, the description, and then a list of episodes instead of just uh, just a single one. Okay. Ah, this podcast only have one episode. So let's try to. Yes, that was correct. And then when I play here, it should play the audio, and this uh, play video will uh, will pop up. Let's see more of this. I don't know if we have audio enabled. Display and it's just it from my computer. <laughs> cool. Uh, and the app will be track of which episode is playing and will toggle uh, the, the play and pause icon accordingly. Uh, so, yeah, that was a quick demo of my app. And now I want to show you some code examples uh, of some problems that I, uh, that I saw. Uh, one issue is, uh, is these two uh, menu items here the display menu and the navigation menu. 
Um, I want to, I want to render them uh, on the screen at all times. Um, so you can see here when I navigate through my app, they will keep uh, keep being there uh, regardless of which uh, which view I'm at. Uh, and to describe the problem, I'm going to give you some more context. And it, it's this uh, navigation header up here. Uh, so, so when you so when you're developing apps, you don't get uh, get navigation uh, built in. You have to do that yourself. Uh, in your browser, for example, when you navigate through a page, uh, you can press um, backwards or forwards depending on how you navigate through a page on each app works. Uh, but that uh, you'll have to implement yourself uh, when doing uh, your native development. And uh, and and that aspect is one of the problems that I uh, that I had while doing these two static uh, menu items. So. Uh, so to do this navigation, I use this app navigation library. Oh, maybe it will be easier for you to see if I change the cost like this. So I use this uh, app navigation uh, library, and with that, I can create a stack navigator, as it's called, which takes in all the components that I want to use uh, inside my navigation, and which names they should have. And then it takes the initial route name. So the original, uh, initial route name is a component that I want to render first for my app. Uh, which in this case will be the random component. Then we have the create app container uh, option. Uh, if any of you are familiar with, with Redux, it's kind of the same uh, principle as, uh, as the connect function. So we'll create a wrapper around all the components and they will gain access to some navigation methods. Uh, so that will be saved into my app container that I can use within uh, my random method, uh, random method of this uh, wrapper class that I have here. Uh, and now to the issue I had is that uh, I have uh, uh, two solutions to this. I could either include these two components in all components that, uh, that you show them, uh, but that would be a lot of reuse of code, and it also um, just didn't look smooth uh, because they, they will keep re-rendering uh, with the other components and not stay static on screen. Uh, so the way that I solved it was to take them out of this navigation flow and, uh, and render them independently uh, here, so you can see they are outside of my app container. Then the issue is, that they lose contact with these navigation methods that live inside my app container. Uh, and I want to, uh, to be able to do some navigation uh, to, uh, with these two. So the way that I solve this, uh, and this might seem familiar if you, if you know React beforehand, is that I made a reference a ref uh, on the instance of my app container. Uh, so, so the reference would be this uh, navigator here. Then I created a dispatch, uh, a dispatch route method that saves in uh, it's written the route name of the to go to and pass it here. And with the React navigation library, it uh, comes to this dispatch method. So when I invoke that, uh, with the route that I want to go to, it goes to that route. And uh, this dispatch route, this patch route method, they are passed out as a prompt to my menu, which I have here. Um, and inside my menu, I have this handle click method uh, that I use on these two items. So it will pass either random or home, uh, depending on which component that I want to go to. And then this happens to be some note, and it will just uh, dispatch the route. Uh, one other thing is that uh, it does is that it updates my store uh, with the current view that, uh, that we have. And I, and I use that to control, uh, to control the color of the icon, so which, uh, which one is the current view that we're looking at. And so that's a, a bit about how I solve this whole navigation issue. Uh, of course, another big feature of my app is the ability to play audio. Uh, so I want to tell you a bit about how that process works as well. Uh, so, uh, so we have the play here, here, which visually is one of the smallest components in my app, uh, but it's actually the app that carries the most logic uh, at the current state uh, of, uh, of my app. So when I, uh, when I press play on an episode, it will update my reader store with the UI for that episode, and then it will render that component, and it will invoke yeah, this play track method that takes in the UI. And this is where the magic starts to happen. So I use this create async method, and when that is invoked, then it will create a new playback instance, as it's called, uh, so, I can, so I can play my audio. And this great async takes in the UI, it takes in some initial status, uh, which is being defined here, so that's just some very basic stuff. It should the audio play? I hope so. Uh, which play is great? It breaks which rate is it playing at, so that's the speed of the audio. Uh, so should it be sped up, should it be slower, or should it be normal speed? Uh, should it be a great pitch, the volume is muted, and is it looping? And then, uh, very interestingly, it takes in this callback. And um, when our uh, playback instance is being initiated, then it will keep invoking this, call, uh, this callback. 
and that will uh, that will help us keep track of the status of the audio uh, audio that we're playing. Yeah, so inside this of the episode data, let's go down to here. We have it here. Yeah, so that will continuously keep updating my store with the player against its position, so that is uh, how many milliseconds into the episode are we? Uh, the player instance duration, that's just how long is the episode. Again, should it play? Uh, is it current playing? Is it buffering? Again, the rate uh, at which the speed uh, should play? Is it muted? And the volume. Uh, but, out, uh, but out of all these parameters, it is especially uh, the combination of the instance position and the instance duration that's interesting because we use these to calculate how far into the episode are we, which is used uh, by this slider here. So the farther we get into the episode, the farther to the right the slider will go. We also use these two parameters to, uh, to calculate when I drag this and then let it go. Um, yeah, where should the audio pick up from? Okay, so that was uh, that was two of the problems I had. Uh, there's a uh, lot more to say about uh, about playing audio. So if you're interested, please do, please feel free to see me after the presentation. I'd love to see the proof. Uh, one other thing about working with Dragon is, is figuring out uh, how do I get to debugging. Uh, I did it two ways, so I was debugging my DS code here in my IDE, and I was logging my app on localhost to get access to the reactive, uh, reactive tools and the Redux dev tools, so I could see my store. Uh, so now it's going to be very interesting to see if I can debug my DS code, because I have some connectivity issues. But uh, let's give it a shot anyway. So when you work with Expo, uh, you have the possibility to debug in, in Expo here, and you can play on a debugger which will give you a QR code that you can scan with the Expo app. So I'm going to try and do that to get my uh, to get my debugger going. Yeah, something is wrong. Try again. Uh, yeah, as I said, I have some connectivity issues, so this won't work here. But I, uh, but I made a video of it, uh, so you can see more up close what is happening. Um, so, uh, so when the, uh, so when you scan your app, when the app will, it will start running the app on your phone, uh, and then you can uh, you can access some dev tools by shaking your phone. Uh, then a screen will pop up that you have some um, uh, some some actions you can do. And one quick note about that: I almost destroyed my computer and my phone doing this uh, because I'm shaking it furiously and put past my computer. <laughs> so just watch out for that when you're deep. <laughs> so. That's fine here. So you shake it and you can see, see you can debug GS remotely, which will enable the debugging in your IDE. And then it will reload. Uh, one other cool thing we can do with this is that we can uh, we can use something called Toggle Inspector. Uh, and that enables you to click on any element on the screen and then you can see what styling is being applied to it. And that is really helpful when you're doing your layout and for example some positioning is up, then you can see uh, what the issue might be. Okay, so since I have some connectivity issues, I sadly cannot share with the debugging within uh, Visual Studio Code, but it works, uh, it works like, like you would suspect. So when it's running, you, you can hit a breakpoint, and, you can, uh, and you, can, you can watch for some uh, variables, and you can also in the debug console get access to what's going on. Uh, yeah. The other way that I did some debugging as well was to launch my app on the web to gain access to React the dev tool and the read the So let's try and see if we can do that. So when you, uh, when you scrap with the product using the uh, use it will give you some predefined scripts. It will give you the start, which will just uh, build your project, give you a QR code that you can scan, so you can run it on your phone. And Android, uh, that, will, uh, that will run your app and Android emulator. It's the same thing for iOS. And then there's this relatively new uh, web uh, scripts that we're going to try. And then uh, then we'll start building my app and, and run it on the host. Uh, one quick uh, note about this feature is that it's not fully implemented yet, and they will also warn you in this log uh, when it starts running uh, that this feature is not really for production yet, so please don't use it. Um, and you will also see when, when my app opens, some stylings will not be correctly applied. And uh, I actually started out developing using this web uh, component, but, um, but I had to, to abandon it at some point because I couldn't trust, uh, it, it trust how my UI looked. As you can see, there's a bit, this big white space down here, which shouldn't be there. Uh, but now we're just getting access to the to red dev tools and real estate dev tools uh, as we're used to, used to, which is super, super handy. OK, that was a quick one about debugging. So let's get back to the presentation. So 
the technologies I used for this was, of course, very native. Uh, I used the Xbox in life to scout my pocket, as I don't have any experience with native code yet. It's definitely something that I want to look into. I used Redux, and I used this right navigation to create an application camera to do navigation within my app. And then I used the Listen Notes API to fetch all the podcast data. And it was actually this, uh, this API that inspired me to do this random functionality because they provide a hit point that just gives you a random episode. And when I saw that, I was like, that's just what I, what I always wanted. <laughs> so why not use it? And we're soon going to go into the publishing process on Google Play. But before we do that, I want to tell you a bit about some issues I faced uh, during development. Uh, one issue is uh, that uh, React Native is still in beta. It's currently uh, version uh, 0.6. And that means that they update it fairly often, and when they do that, it oftentimes comes with it comes with very breaking uh, changes. Uh, so if you update some of your dependencies, might it might not be uh, compiled anymore. And as a result of them um, updating fairly often, is that some of the guidance that you might find on a site or also for example, it might be uh, might be updated pretty quickly. Uh, so so you need to, to be patient sometimes when you're looking for uh, for a solution. Uh, I had some issues setting up the reactive tools. Uh, so it is possible to do a setup uh, where uh, when you enable the remote ESD button, it will automatically launch the reactive tools and you have a nice interface to, uh, to debug with. Uh, I wasn't successful in doing that, but I found this workaround with the, uh, with the, with the web script. And that brings me to a piece of advice. See if Expo provides what you need. Um, so initially I had a, uh, I had a very hard time uh, figuring out how to get audio to play because I was trying a lot of packages. Some of them were deprecated, some of them just didn't work, some worked but not. Uh, so I spent a lot of time with that until I found out that Expo actually provides an audio component for you that just works. That I could have saved you a lot of time. Yeah. So again, uh, if you want to implement some new functionality in your app, check the Expo documentation first. It, it might save you, let's say, eight hours, for example. <laughs> okay. So now you develop your app and you want to share it with the world. So what do you do? You publish it on Google Play, of course. And uh, I have to admit that this process was actually a lot easier than I, than I expected. Uh, so you start by signing up for the Gold account. Uh, and if you want to charge money for your app but do in-app purchases, uh, then you have to sign up for a merchant account as well. And then, you, uh, then in the Google Play dashboard, uh, you, you, you register the app. And then the fun begins. Then you need to do some store listing. Uh, so there's uh, some information you need to provide uh, and, and give to the store. Uh, one thing being, uh, graphic assets. Uh, so sadly, I myself are not, uh, are not gifted in creating graphical assets, um, but I found out that there are some nice tools out there online uh, that will help you uh, generate some assets. They do look fairly generic though, but it will help you get started because it is, it is required um, it, it to, to publish your app. And product details, that is uh, things such as um, short description of your app, long description, uh, which category it does fall under, and, uh, and similar things. And then privacy policy, uh, which is one of the most important things. So, uh, so if you're making an app that requires permissions uh, from the user to gain access to the camera, to gain access to the user's location, uh, then you have to provide this privacy policy uh, to inform your user about what are you doing with this kind of data. Uh, and when you upload, you upload your APK to the Google Play Store, and I will cover what an APK is uh, in a moment, uh, then it will go through it and check does your app require any permissions and give you a warning uh, if you haven't provided a, a privacy policy. And that happened to me. I don't require any user permissions for my app, but when I upload it, it, says, it seems like you require all permissions. Uh, and I was like, oh, I don't remember doing that. But it turns out that Expo defaults to requiring all permissions if you don't specify otherwise. Uh, so you just have to go into, the, in this case, Android configuration and, um, and say that permissions uh, is zero or an empty array that will um, that will show that it, that it don't require anything. And then you upload this infamous APK. So what is that? Uh, it is short for Android Package Kit. Um, so when you want to publish your app, you need to, to build it first. And when you do that, you send it to Expo servers, uh, and they will build it for you. It might take some time, depending on when you do it, uh, because there might be other project, uh, projects queued, uh, uh, queued for you to get built. Um, but as soon as you add, starts building, you can you can see a lot of uh, how far the process it, process it is, and then afterwards you can just download it. So we get this APK file that we can just immediately upload to the Google Play Store. Sorry again. 
and then you need to go to do content rating, which is basically just a questionnaire where you fill out uh, is there any profanity in your app, is there any adult material, is it family friendly, and, and similar things. And then Google Play will, will, automatic, will automatically generate a content rating for you. And then pricing and distribution. And one very important note here is that it is possible for you uh, to start up charging money for your app and then make it free, but you can't do it the other way around. So you can make it free and then charge money for it. Uh, if you do that, uh, publish it for free and change your mind, then you will actually have to take it off the store uh, and publish it again. And that can be quite a pain if you already already have users uh, using it and you have some user reviews, for example, uh, th then, you will, then you will lose all that data. And then you publish. Uh, so there are a couple of ways of going about this. You can publish for internal tests, uh, you can publish for beta, and you can publish for production. Uh, so at the moment, my app is actually um, published for beta, so uh, please feel free to try it out. I'd love to hear feedback on it. Uh, if you want to scan this QR code or get, um, or get a download link, uh, please see me after the presentation, and then I would love to share it with you. Okay, so today you hopefully learned how easy it is as a JS developer to get started with React Native how to debug, and the publishing process on Google Play, and, and what things you need to watch out for. And most importantly, please, 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 come on. <laughs> <laughs> Keep a phone grip on your phone while debugging. It may cost you both your computer <laughs> and your phone. <laughs> so that's my presentation. If you want to talk, uh, please, please, please feel free to see me. Thank you so much for listening. So as Rachel said, uh, my name is TJ Epperson, and I'll be talking to you today about both creating and managing your first open source project. Um, so before we get started, uh, can all the programmers in the audience let me know who you are? How many of you are programmers in any form or fashion? Cool. How many have you contributed to an open source project? One? Oh, several. How many have you created an open source project? Two. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Cool. All right. So hopefully everyone will be able to uh, get something out of this. So a little bit about myself, my background. Um, I'm from Atlanta, Georgia in the US. That's where I was born and raised for most of my life. Uh, I have work experience in three continents. So I have worked uh, in Germany and now in Japan as well. Um, I speak English natively, of course. Uh, also speak uh, German and since coming to Japan, uh, I speak at least conversational Japanese. Um, I was a singer for five years from my time in middle school and high school and actually had the uh, privilege to be uh, a member of a chorus that got to sing in Carnegie Hall in New York, so that was a very unique experience. Um, of course, grew up playing with a lot of games. Um, and doing a lot of modding and some of my first programming experiences are looking up mods for the original Half-Life, right? Looking at all those C++ documents, finding all the numbers I want to change and playing with those. And that was, you know, my introduction to lines of code. Um, I'm also very interested and have a little bit of background in data science. So moving on, what is open source? So open source just means that the source code for your application is out in the open. It is free for modification and for distribution. Um, and why should you contribute to one? Uh, so open source software is becoming more and more popular. Uh, more applications uh, are becoming uh, open source. Over 80% of companies are using open source software. Uh, they are a great way to contribute to other developers, to end consumers, to other businesses as well. I'm sure everyone here, whether you realize or not, has used at some point open source software. So, one key point in using contributing open source software is feature exploration. When you're using open source software and there's a feature in particular that you like, or that you're curious about, you actually have the opportunity to look at the code and figure out how they did it and why they did it the way they did. Um, coding practices, you're gonna see all the way from you know, a single developer putting together an application and look at how they styled everything, 
as opposed to looking at even enterprise, uh, enterprise grade production level code and a lot of the differences that are involved there. Um, collaboration. So it's an opportunity for you to connect and work with other developers, even other developers who you can't put a face to. Um, you get to compare your coding style and the changes you want to make to what they work with. And there's a lot of opportunities to develop as a programmer in those forms. Uh, reputation. So this is a great way to give yourself clout. Not only can you program, not only can you make applications yourself, but you have the capacity to take code that other people have written or numerous other people have written, adapt to those coding standards, adapt to the way that they're running that program, and contribute yourself. That is a huge skill, and it really goes a long way when talking to other people about what your abilities are as a developer. So now a little bit about why you'd start one. So one of the unique opportunities you have is that you get to see the complete software development life cycle. As a professional developer, especially in a uh, you know, medium company or a large company or a company that revolves around one major application, you're not always going to have the opportunity to see the entire process of software development from the idea conception to its complete release. There's a lot of detail in that. You may work in a department that's siloed off to some degree, or most of the application features are already implemented, or maybe you're just doing maintenance only. This is a way for you to take something from idea conception and see a real product come out at the end and every step along the way. So it's a great way to expand your own scope and your own perspective for other projects you work on. You get experience using version control systems. I'm sure most of us have experience with Git and GitHub, things like that, and managing version control. But when you create an open source project, you have to know exactly how that's set up and what features are being implemented. All the webhooks, is there continuous integration? Um, if other people are making PRs, uh, are you familiar with you know, rolling back uh, merges? Do you know how to edit your commit history? Do you know how to use the cherry picking features? So there's a lot of details that as a team member you may kind of uh, miss out on. And these are great things to know because when you are working in a team, understanding what your team lead or what the manager has to go through will give you a very important uh, perspective. Code review, right? So looking through all lines of code that someone else wrote. Um, it's commonly said that writing code and reading code are very different skills, and I'm sure most of us would agree with that. Uh, and this is an excellent opportunity. Not only are you reading code that's written by other people, but you're reading, by, you're reading code that's written by other people that's not even necessarily part of your team. People that may have entirely different programming concepts, different coding styles, which means you need to be able to read that code, not only follow the logic, but imagine what their thought process was, especially if it's on large changes. So this is an excellent way to develop that skill. Uh, and marketing. It's an opportunity to see what it's like to get an application out there. Because marketing an application and marketing an open source project in a lot of respects uh, are not so different. What kind of online uh, venues are you going through? How are you reaching people? How are you connecting with people? Are you taking the opportunity in person? Are you trying to reach people online, people in a similar group, entirely different audiences? Uh, and it's a very valuable skill to have. Uh, sense of community, especially when you work in open source groups, if there's a community that focuses around open source development, if you have the same people contributing to one project, you kind of get to know everyone, uh, there's a good degree of comfort that you can achieve and it's a very rewarding feeling to be able to start recognizing the names that are popping up on these repositories. And ultimately, knowledge diffusion. The point is, as a developer, you want to teach others because it helps you solidify what you're doing and it gives you that, that fulfillment when you can help someone else develop themselves. And just in the reverse, it's an opportunity for you to learn from more experienced uh, developers. So, 
Uh, my personal motivation, why did I get into open source projects? Why did I bother creating one? Well, that's a fun story. So this is Rebus. This is a simple open source project, a simple game that I found when I was feeling particularly motivated to contribute to an open source project. Um, it had a pretty neat concept and it was simplistic enough, it was easy to pick up, and uh, it was exciting enough that I would feel good about contributing to it. So Rebus is a game where uh, you just take letters and pictures, you combine them, and you make a word, and you just write it in. So can anybody go ahead and tell me what the answer to this is? Starfish. Yeah, starfish, right, starfish, starfish. Right, all of you are here as <laughs> experts. And I thought, hey, that's pretty cool. I would feel good about contributing to this, and so I did. Uh, so I decided to make a PR, um, and I added not only some of the puzzles that are used in it, but I also added a new feature. Um, so I was really motivated. I wanted to write good, clean code. I followed the coding standards that were there in the repository already. Um, I even provided some tests for the thing I was writing. Um, and I felt particularly good about being able to add a feature. So there were hundreds of cards. And if you want to move to a certain card, you can only scroll one at a time. And I thought, ah, oh, all right, I'll make something where you can hold shift and you can just scroll by 10 at a time. Cool, new feature, why would they reject it? You don't have to use it. It's a good way to guarantee a merge. And then I submitted the PR, felt happy, checked it, checked it, waited, waited, and then I actually looked at their PRs, and then I realized, okay, there are 36 open PRs, and some of them are, see we have 25 days ago, some were six months old, and now I realized, Oh my god, I just got really excited, really motivated, and it's a dead repository. No one's checking it. No one even cares. This sucks. So, I decided, you know what? That would never happen if it were my repository. So, I decided to make my own open source project to avoid the wait times. Yeah. So, the case study we will be looking at is my open source project called Rymus. So very creative take on Rebus, right? Um, so I'll give you a current state demo of what Rhymus looks like right now. So you can see it's very similar to Rebus. And there's a sentence here that doesn't quite make sense. Uh, just intuitively looking at it, can anybody guess what the key word is, what the answer is? Dog. Yeah, right, so let's give it a shot. We just type in dog, enter, oh, look at that, and it goes on. The next one, right? I did not hear the phone because I was a sheep. <laughs> right, and we can type in something that doesn't make sense. We get red. What's the answer? Sleep. Sleep. Ah, sleep. These are these little images up there, and they are dynamic. So you can link up badges to your repository and they will update automatically. So they had certain badges such as whether or not the build was passing, uh, the test coverage, um, other features, social features, and some of the key badges, like first timers only, friendly, open source. There are many badges that let users know, hey, you're welcome here, you can get into it freely. Um, those are very important and they're very eye-catching. It's one of the first things you're going to see on public repositories at the top of the README. Step-by-step uh, -step guides. If you had no idea what you're doing, even as a programmer, you don't know what you're doing, there are such thorough step-by-step -step guides. You can just follow it, even if you don't fully understand what you're doing, and make a meaningful contrib contribution and get a PR merged. Um, Contribution guidelines, what they expect of you. When you're contributing, how do you need to name your branches? How much code do you need to write? Do you need to include tests? Uh, do you need to rename your PR? What kind of details do you need when you create your PR? So it's all very clear. No one has to guess uh, if it might be rejected or not. Motivating language. Of course, if they're open source, they want contributors 
and a lot of them tend to be beginner oriented. So there's a lot of positive language. Hey, thanks for coming to the repository. Really, it's easy to contribute even if you don't know what you're doing. Give it a shot. If it doesn't work out, we'll help you get it there. It was all very inclusive and there was nothing intimidating about the process. Um, so as I said, they are beginner oriented. Uh, not necessarily every open source project is for beginners or even for beginners only, um, but there are some aspects, especially in the contribution guidelines that are designed for uh, beginners. So it's very beginner inclusive. And then the more advanced users, the more advanced developers end up kind of naturally uh, reading through documentation and reading through the code itself and contributing in different ways. Uh, the use of issues. So in GitHub, issues, uh, you'll see our little tags down here. They make very, very excellent use of these, posting things that need to be added, need to be changed. These are key ways of letting people know what they can do, the degree of difficulty, what kind of changes, what kind of coding might be involved, and they also tie in well to GitHub's automation. So I want to talk about my goals when I decided to set out on this project. Um, I wanted to create an excellent README. So as you saw, all the badges, all the details, all the guidelines, that's in the README. The README is the first impression of your project. It's the first thing people are going to look at, and if it's not good, it's going to stop there, and people aren't going to go much further. So it is absolutely the handshake of open source projects. So it's important to have a well-designed, uh, clear and concise README file. Um, appealing GitHub repository. So I wanted to make a repository that not only had an attractive README, but had a good layout, took advantage of the features of it, so that when people look at it, they say, OK, there's a lot going on here. It's clearly being taken seriously. So it makes sense that I use my time to contribute to this. Uh, automation. I wanted to learn something about automation. Everywhere I've been seeing it in big repositories and in some of the assignments or almost all of the assignments at Code Chrysalis, there's been automation, um, which I think was uh, an incredibly interesting feature to have. So I wanted to learn something about that myself. Uh, project initialization. I wanted to know how much I needed to create to get a uh, open source project up and running and what steps I should take to make that happen. Inclusive design, I wanted the project to be able to include all kinds of developers. You want to provide a sense of difficulty for the more experienced ones, a sense of need for the more experienced developers, but you want to cater to the more beginners. You want to provide everyone the opportunity to contribute because there are a lot of beginners out there that are easily intimidated, but at the same time, they have a lot that they can provide to you and other people working on your project. Uh, and longevity. I wanted to find a way that uh, I can provide people that are contributing a sense of fulfillment in the long term, that it's not just come in here, throw in a couple of objects, and make a PR, and you're done, but that this project actually has a direction. And if you come back later, or if you help us progress to a later point, it's going to look different, it's going to feel different, and we're going to have different needs uh, in our contributions. Uh, and of course, tying back to my experience, minimal merge delay. I want people to feel fulfilled that they can make a PR, and they don't have to wait forever, and they can like jump to that satisfied feeling a lot faster than I was able to. And then constructive feedback when people make these pull requests, when I'm making comments, if someone's requesting changes, if people have questions, I want to take time to really clearly explain it, to explain it to their level so that they feel that through that communication they're actually getting more out of it than just writing code and having it merge somewhere. And then recurring collaborators, that ties right with that. I want people to have a positive experience so that they come back and do something else in this project at some other point. So, uh, you saw what rhymes look like, how it played, an idea, right? So it's just a simple rhyming game. Um, I wanted people to complete the logic of the sentence by correcting one word 
and uh, correcting it to a word that it rhymes with, right? So I need to take a steak, right? I need to take a break. So that was the concept, and because it was text-based, it was going to be easy to jump into, um, and it had simple program logic, which means getting the minimum viable product up and running wasn't going to take too much, uh, too much effort. And it had instant playability. There's no startup time. There's no wind down time. You can jump into it immediately, use it immediately, and get a complete picture of what this is supposed to be, and then finish when you want to finish. Uh, so the platform I used was GitHub. Uh, so I used the GitHub repository, of course, public, as all the open source ones are. Um, I created a single branch, right, just a master branch, so everything is going to there. Um, and I made use of the repository tags. So repository tags are essentially the keywords that you can apply to a repository to help it show up in the uh, search functions and help guide users to your project. Um, there is a projects board on GitHub. Here you can kind of, uh, you can use, for example, Kanban boards to write what kind of things need to be done, whether or not they're being worked on, whether or not they're blocked, if there are any issues with them, or whether or not they're finished. Uh, so I took advantage of those from the start to kind of give people an opportunity to see what needs to be done uh, at that point. Um, issues, so we talked a little bit about the issue tags that I saw other repositories using. Uh, issues are great, particularly help wanted and good first issues are ways to attract people to your repository and they should absolutely be taken advantage of. Um, they are a good way to remove a lot of intimidation for people that are trying to get into contributing to your repository. Um, automation. So you can actually hook up ish, uh, the issues tags to your automation, to your Kanban board, so that when a new issue is created, it will automatically be posted there. And you can create other hooks that when certain PRs are made, uh, they will move it throughout the project board automatically. Um, so this is the groundwork I went through in order to get this project up and running. The first thing was, of course, the README. So um, because the README is the first impression, I wanted to take care of as many details off the bat before I put any, else, any other major uh, files into the repository. Uh, I wanted to provide a simple explanation. I also assume that a lot of people that, looking at it, that are looking at this will not necessarily be native English speakers, so I wanted to write it as concisely and neatly as possible to not exclude those billions of people, right? Um, I wanted to write the, uh, the experience. What is this application supposed to look like and feel? When people are using it, what is supposed to be the, uh, the experience of it? What's supposed to happen? Um, the design, so I talked about the way the code was going to flow, what the progress of the code is going to look like, how it's going to change over time, so that people understand what we're working toward, and contribution recommendations. So for the new people coming in where they don't know where to start, um, I give them a list of options that you can start by making changes to the readme. You can fix typos if you want to. You can go where the objects are for the puzzles and just follow the pattern and add a simple object. Uh, basically all the entry points for contributors. The contribution guidelines, uh, how they should name their branches, how they should make the pull request, what kind of information, and I wanted to remove all doubt from it and make it almost as boilerplate uh, as possible so that anyone who wouldn't kind of naturally and intuitively understand these things, have something to go off of. And then step-by-step -step guide. I really enjoyed this from the other repositories, that if you don't know anything about coding, if you never even touch JavaScript, you can follow the guide on here and do exactly as it says, even if you have no idea what Git is, and you can actually contribute to this project. So the next thing I worked on is the folder structure. Um, if you've ever looked at another project and you've seen one giant folder with everything in root, or if you've seen projects that have uh, you know, eight folders nested in each other and then 23 index.js's, you can imagine that's 
not a good feeling and you can, it's kind of frustrating thinking about diving into all that and really trying to comprehend what's happening. So when I created the folder structure, I wanted it to be organized and purpose theme, right? So all the JavaScript in one, the CSS in another, the views in another, and the test in another. Uh, I wanted to leave the root for all the configuration stuff, right? So we have the automation configuration to get that basically people can look at the root and just say, okay, that's all the config stuff. Maybe I don't need to mess with that. Um, and I wanted to include testing files. Uh, so testing files for the more advanced users or for the beginners who want to look at it. There's a lot of simple, easy to get started tests in there. Um, the groundwork for the coding. So this is something that uh, took a lot of consideration because if you do too much, people come in and say, okay, well, I'm not going to make much of an impact. It's pretty much all done. What am I going to do? And if you don't do enough, people don't want to contribute because they think, I don't even understand the general flow of this. So even if I write code that works, and the person who started this repository doesn't like the way I personally set it up because there's so little direction, maybe they'll reject it and there's just, there's just too much unknown. So uh, I started off by implementing some basic functionality. Uh, so here's the actual game logic. Um, so creating the updating displays, checking answers, correct answers, uh, the general flow of the uh, game logic. Object design. Objects are an awesome way to get new people into your repository. If you are um, using something that uses objects, they are essentially just a blueprint that anybody can follow, that it's intuitive enough, that even nobody, even if someone doesn't understand object notation, if they don't understand what JavaScript is, they can follow these patterns and contribute on their own. So they are an excellent way to get people involved of very, very beginner levels. Uh, empty functions. So you can see down here the game over function, even though it's called, uh, it is empty, but it doesn't affect the gameplay loop. So leaving empty functions is a pretty clear way, aside from leaving a bunch of comments that say fix me, uh, it's a clear way to say, okay, there's something that should be here that's not, and if you want to, you can start putting things in there yourself. Um, an ugly functional front end. So the CS, uh, the CSS, uh, actually done by Mark, the previous speaker, um, we created a very minimal front end that was functional, but incredibly unappealing. Because there are a lot of people that like to come in and just make things pretty. And a lot of front end people who may not be as familiar with JavaScript. CSS has uh, a little easier time, it's a little easier of a time for people to get into. A lot of people, when they get into web design, they'll start with HTML and CSS before they even touch JavaScript. So that's a way to grab onto those people as well. Um, so I made use of the project boards on GitHub, as you can see. Uh, and it's a good way to kind of set what you're working toward, what needs to be done. Over time, I found that this feature was ultimately not very helpful for outside collaborators Particularly because only the people who are registered as uh, collaborators, who are registered as the people with admin privileges, are able to actually move the individual projects to in progress or to finished. Uh, so that was soon after um, abandoned. Um, but there is automation you can hook up. So we talked about uh, issues. You can set up automation so that whenever issues are created, they are automatically added to the list and there are ways to set up hooks so that even other people can contribute, make PRs, and then when certain PRs are made, um, it will flag this, move it to either in progress or to done. So that is a feature you can take advantage of. Um, talking about longevity, how do I provide people with a sense of long-term oriented goals with such a simple project? Uh, I decided a great way to do that would be refactoring into commonly used frameworks. Um, so I wrote in the README that once the project becomes feature complete enough, once we're happy with its current state as a community, then we can open up additional branches 
and refactor it into view, refactor it into React. So this provides an opportunity to provide depth to the project. You're not just doing this basic HTML, CSS, JavaScript. There's actually much deeper path you can follow. Um, it's going to expand the difficulty. If uh, it's not difficult enough doing it the simple way, there's something for you to come back to. If it's just right doing what you're doing now, keep contributing because we're going to go somewhere that's going to help you develop as a developer yourself along, uh, along the way. And there's going to be a learning curve. Uh, refactoring and taking all the code we've written and moving it into another system. For people who want to get into it from the start, this is a way for them to jump into these frameworks cleanly and get into it for themselves. If that's too much of a curve for them, they can uh, watch other people do some of the refactoring, see the steps by steps, and it's going to be easier for them to follow, especially if they contributed during the early stages. Uh, so my initial observations uh, when I started and was running this repository, um, the first thing I noticed was there's a complete lack of exposure. Nobody is looking at my repository. No one is coming here and checking things out. Um, and I didn't have any repeat contributors. So even the people that I have talked to that I said, hey, um, I got this open source project. If you'd like, take a look at it, contribute. And they said, sure, uh, here's a readme tweak, see you. Or, oh, OK, I added an object, see you. And then that was that. Um, some of the ambiguous GitHub systems, right? They have the stars for favoriting your repositories, and they have forking, right? That is kept track of. So they do have search engines uh, for repositories, but how does that tie in with the stars? Um, is it a lot of stars in a short time? Is it just the number of stars, period? Does how many forks it has contribute? to where it shows in the search result. Uh, a lot of this was pretty unclear uh, to me when trying to figure out how to increase my exposure. Uh, ultimately, a loss of morale. It's, it's kind of a bummer, right, to put so much effort into something and think, I want to do something for the community. I want to do something for all developers because I'm a developer. I remember when I first started out, and I remember coming here and still starting out with a lot of new systems. And I remember how awesome it feels when you're struggling and someone's there to walk you through it step by step. I know that feeling and I want to be able to do that for other people myself. And you put together everything and no one even comes. And just imagine throwing yourself out there and no one's asking for help or no one wants to uh, work with you in this, this sense. Uh, so that was pretty not a good feeling. Um, but then I had an epiphany, and you know, a lot of these bad feelings came as I was putting this project together, and I thought to myself, um, I did so much all of this time, all of this preparation and effort, and this is all I got. I have a repository that I added some code to, and then a few people came and made some minor changes, and that's that. Um, so uh, then I took a step back and I thought to myself, okay, I just said I did so much, all of this preparation and effort. And then I stopped there and then I thought, okay, I have to entirely change my perspective on what I just did. Because if I look at the progress over the realization, then this was absolutely worth everything I've done up to this point. Even if I didn't make it to the very end of what I wanted to do, I had to come such a long way just to get to that part of the disappointment, right? Just to get to that, I had to come so far. And just by doing all these things, continuous integration, the automation, learning the Kanban boards, learning the GitHub systems, all this has put me so far ahead of those who haven't had the chance to experience that yet. So. I'll just quickly go over some of the skills I've developed doing this. Um, project management, going from idea conception to putting something that's actually working, uh, was a critical development for me. Uh, of course, the big three, right? HTML, CSS, JavaScript. Uh, that includes a lot of import, export, especially when you're managing your folders and you want clean files and you want things to be logical. This is something that's easily overlo uh, overlooked, managing your imports and exports in JavaScript. 
Um, DOM manipulation. Got a lot of practice in that. Adding classes, manipulating class names, um, uh, dynamically generating content on a page. And I used Travis for continuous integration to run the automated test on GitHub. So that was quite an experience learning how that's all put together. Of course, a Git, uh, GitHub and all their systems. And Chai and Boca for the testing. So I learned a lot about testing, testing in a browser versus testing in Node. So that was a very useful experience. Um, one small thing, and I wasn't planning on sharing this, but this came up yesterday, actually. Um, uh, so I want to reframe this as the perspective of creating and managing an open source project for yourself. That when you do this, it's great to do it with a community mindset, but take it from the perspective that this is something you are doing for yourself because you're going to get so much out of it. Uh, so this, this happened yesterday. Um, this was the first completely outside, non-related to Code Chrysalis, non-related to anybody I've met, pull request that I had in this open source project. Um, this is the gentleman that just added some simple objects. That's it. And he made his pull request, and I requested some changes, and he made them. But this is the message when he first sent um, his PR. And he said, thanks for making this great project. Um, I looked at this man's repository and saw tons of tutorials, API tutorials, um, website tutorials, HTML, CSS, basic JavaScript tutorials. This guy was just starting out. And when he made this pull request, he had the tag as first time contributor, meaning out of all the projects that this guy could have contributed to, he chose mine to make his very first contribution to an open source project, and then I thought, that is, that is crazy. This is something he's always going to remember because of a project I just took a few days and put together. And aside from all the feeling that I got uh, developing myself, this by far was the best feeling I've had so far since, since working so much in development. And I just uh, wanted, wanted to share that experience. So. Um, Thank you very much for all your time, for coming, for listening to me. Um, this is my LinkedIn information, my uh, GitHub's over there. You can also check out my uh, personal site at the bottom. Uh, thank you guys so much for choosing this talk to come and listen to. I appreciate it.